Hi, my name is Paul Grogan and welcome to episode 49 of the Gaming Rules podcast. This podcast is going to be a recording done at Manacon, which is a UK board game convention which I was at last weekend. And I met up with Matt Evans from Creaking Shelves and decided that I was going to record the podcast there and then at Manacon. Now, the disadvantage of that is we had to find a quiet room in order to record the podcast. And unfortunately, the room that we found there was quite a lot of echo. So I do apologise in advance for the audio quality in this podcast. If you want to uh, discuss anything that we've talked about in this podcast, then please feel free to contribute onto the BGG Guild. I'll be putting a link to the thread in the show notes on the YouTube channel. If you're listening to this uh, not on YouTube or anywhere else, then just pop on to Board Game Geek. The guild number is 2258, and I'll be starting a podcast discussion thread there. Because in this podcast, Matt's going to be talking about some of the games that he's been playing at uh, Manacon this weekend. And I've also been talking about blind playtesting, which is one of the hot topics at the moment, as there have been a few rule books that have come out in the last 12 months where people have really, really struggled to play the game from the rule book. Part of my job role with various publishers is to do something called blind playtesting, which helps fix that problem. So I've been asked to talk about blind playtesting and my involvement in it. Anyway, without further ado, let's get on to the bit recorded at Manacon. So, I'm here at Manacon. It's Sunday lunchtime. I'm here with Matt Evans from Creaking Shelf. Say hello, Matt. Hello, Matt. And uh, we're going to talk about Manacon. So, Manacon is a convention which has been going for 35 years. I think this is the 35th year. Yeah, it says on your badge, Manacon 35. So, Manacon's been going for 35 years. It's a board game convention in Leicester. It's not always been in Leicester, in the UK. It gets... I, can't, I don't know how many people are here, 200 and... 200 odd, yeah. Or something like that. So compared to a lot of conventions, it's not, you know, huge. Uh, now, I remember coming to Manicon in the early 90s, I think. So back before I got really, really into board games, in, in the late 90s, and back before we had Settlers of Catan, I was playing games like uh, Axis and Allies, Acquire Diplomacy, and all of that sort of stuff. Um, and I actually remember coming to Manicon for a couple of years consecutively, and we played those sorts of games here. Now, then I went off and did other things, and then I only returned to Manicon, I think, four or five years ago now. Um, but it's one of my favourite conventions. It's three hours' drive for me, which is not too bad. The space is good. Some of the conventions I go to tend to be a little busy, and this one, for me, it's just the right, just the right size. There's yeah. enough tables. I've been to the, uh, a few of similar events mm -hmm. around the country. Um, uh, so, so Midcon, for example, in Derby, yep. ends up spread over lots of little rooms. Yes. Whereas here, it's in one big room. Most of it, yeah. There's a couple of side rooms, particularly for like the 18xx yes. guys. Yes. Yeah. Odd bits and pieces, but mostly we're all in one space, which is quite nice. Yeah. I really yeah. quite like that. I like sticking in the main room. And Bacon, which is near me down in Exeter, so I go to that every year. Bacon's great, but there's, there's too many people in the main room, so it's very, very noisy and it, it's, it's a bit cramped. So anyway, that's a little bit about Manicon. Now, I've been here now for 48 hours. I've played one game, because I'm here working. Um, and it was a game that I played with Matt, and that was uh, Igloo Pop, I think it was. It, it was, <laughs> we think. We think. Um, <laughs> so it, it was a 20 minute fun game. Now, I was, I was go it, was late, it was late last night, and I was like, I was about to go to bed, and they said, oh, do you want to play this? And it was like, you know, it's a game that takes lots of players. It had little igloos. And I thought, okay, this is just going to be a fun, silly, throwaway game. And actually, it, it was a good game. It was a well-designed game. Um, basically, good. <laughs> yeah, you, you have these igloos in the middle of the board. And these igloos have a number of tokens inside them. And there's a number yeah. printed on the bottom of the igloo that tells you how many tokens are inside it. A little, like little plastic beads. Yes. Uh, and what you're supposed to do is when, when somebody says go, you grab one of the igloos, you shake it and then you try to guess how many beads there are in it from just listening to it. And then you, 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 put, the, you put your marker in the igloo and you put it on a card, and that is you saying, I think there's this number of beads on there. Um, and it sounds really silly, but actually as a game, it worked really well. Yep, it's crazy. Uh, yeah. When they got it out, I was like, ah, oh, I don't really want to play this. Yeah. Uh, fine. I felt the same, <laughs> but playing it was fun and it worked. It really was. And what was interesting about it, it was a skill game. The skill is trying to guess how many beads are in there from listening to it. Yep, and you really can figure it out. Yeah. I found I was actually getting pretty good at figuring out what number was in there, yeah. but I was really slow about doing it, so right. I only got one 
shot at. But did you win in the one end? Or two. No, 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 you I, didn't. But you I collected did well. a lot of cards. Yeah, I got the second or third, I think. Yeah. And in the end, it was just I wasn't doing it fast enough. Right. In order to get enough points. Yeah. So that's the only game we've played together. But what games have you been playing that you want to talk about? Uh, I've played, yeah, I've played a bunch of things. What's really great about these conventions, uh, I find, is that it's kind of a good opportunity for me to play games that I really like playing, but mm -hmm. don't get a chance to normally because I'm reviewing stuff. Uh, right. But a dedicated chunk of time, so I've played Great Western Trail again, which yep. I love. Um, I played New Angeles. Okay. Is that one you've... Sorry. I've not played it, I've heard things about it. Cool. I've heard good and bad things about it. Yeah, so. I, it's a game that has a really strong idea of what it wants to be. Right. And if you like that, then you'll get a lot out of it. Okay. But if you don't, you'll hate it. So New right. Angeles is a semi-cooperative uh, negotiation game in the Android Netrunner universe. Right. So you're all playing as the benevolent corporations of the city of New Angeles trying to make uh, as much money as possible, but you only really care about beating one other person. Okay. Uh, so you can have multiple winners and multiple losers, but you also have to make sure that the city's terrible problems don't get out of control. Right, otherwise, otherwise everybody loses. Everybody Normal loses. Normal semi-co-op stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And there may be someone there who wants the city to fall apart. Oh, it's their, it's their victory condition, is it? Yes. Oh, right. So okay. there may be someone trying to drive yeah. Up to the threat level as it is, up okay. to the max. Um, and then it's each turn is just a negotiation over what we're going to try and do to improve the situation in the city. Right. Or, you know, improve. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Brackets, you know. Um, and so it's a free for all. Of, it's a lot of negotiation. Yeah. Right. Every round, it's just constant, constant negotiation and trying to engineer situations so that your corporation can get the most okay. benefit out of okay. whatever you And you've doing. done a review of this. I have, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I this thought was, you did. Yeah, it was a few months ago. Yeah, I didn't uh, read it because I'd already heard that it was a semi-co-op game with lots of negotiation. So straight away, your thing. That, yeah, that's, that's out of my wheelhouse completely. Yeah. Um, so, yes, yeah, so that's New Angeles. Yeah. What else have you been playing? I also uh, played, ooh, there's a certain game that I think people are talking about quite a bit at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, so let's get in your contractually oh, obligated yes, yeah, yeah. mention. <laughs> uh, Founders of Gloomhaven. This is the Gloomhaven segment, Isaac, if you're listening. Yeah. So, yes. <laughs> you, need a, you need like a do, you know, musical jingle for that. I do, I do. <laughs> so yes, yeah, so one reason why I've not been playing any games is that I've been demoing Founders of Gloomhaven and unsurprisingly, that's the game I've demoed more than anything else this weekend. I think I've done seven demos of it now over the weekend and you played in the one on i, I, I don't know saturday morning, saturday morning. I, think I got in there first thing saturday morning right uh shall i explain it right okay. if you want to yeah if you i'll give it a shot it, yeah. it is a very interactive euro game is what i'm kind of calling it um so it's a city building game you're building the city of gloomhaven um you have a card system that's very reminiscent of concordia mm -hmm. Um, which is nice, it's a nice card system. Um, and then it's about uh, getting access to the right resources in the right places and then building out from those bigger buildings which get you more valuable, like higher level resources yep. to eventually be able to contribute to the construction of the biggest, most the prestige building. Prestige yes. Buildings, that's the one. yes. So can I ask you if you enjoyed it and you can you say can. whatever you want? Yeah. <laughs> It was, it was very clever. Mm -hmm. I did not get my head around it for... Right. <laughs> I felt like, so, I think it's a game where it's going to take a couple of times, a couple of plays for people to get the most out of yeah. it. Because it's quite easy to make mistakes at the start. Yes. Yeah. Which then kind of compound your problems throughout yeah. the game. So I kind of felt like I made a couple of maybe poor choices at the start yeah. and never felt like I was going to do very well right. for the entire game. Because you were lagging behind on victory points most of the game by quite a substantial yeah. amount. But how did it work out in the somehow, end? Somehow, somehow, I managed to uh, swing into second you place. You got second place in the so end, I yeah, yeah, yeah. So I didn't win, um, but I managed to do far better than I thought I did. Yes. Um, partly because people didn't block me on the few things that right, I could okay. do to get out of it. But, you know, once you get into the mid-game, it's like you have... A bit more, you have more direction in the mid game than yes. you do at the start. Yep. Um, and so people are then working on their own things more than they're trying to get in the way of yeah. people in last place, say. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think it worked out really nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm 
yes, I would like to play it some more right. to get the most out of it. Yeah, well, um, a few people that have played it this weekend, because the way that I, I do the demos is getting people playing as soon as possible, teach you the rules as you go along. It's a learning game, write it off as a learning game yes. and don't worry about it. Yes. And a lot of them have said, right, I, I, I want to play this again. Are you still here tomorrow? Because now we know the rules. I want to now be in control of you know my, my whole game right from the start. Yeah. As you say, it's a kind of game where I think, yeah, write the first game off as a learning game, but I do that with most games anyway yeah. these days. Um, if you want to know more about Founders of Gloomhaven, the previous podcast to this one, I interviewed the designer, so we were talking about it a bit on there. But yes, yeah. that's, that's why I've not been playing any games, and that's another game you've yeah. played. I think my one uh, kind of biggest disappointment with it is that it's, it, it's Gloomhaven in kind of name only. Which is something to bear in mind. Like I, I it's fair, it's fine that it is that because you know a solid Euro game is a great thing yeah. to have. But I just I do wish that um, Isaac had been able to bring more of the theme into it. Right. So like like there's not even any magic no. in the game, right? And that's a big thing in right. Gloomhaven universe. Yeah. So it's kind of you know you've got the buildings that you recognise and you build mm -hmm. as you're building the city from if you've played Gloomhaven you'll start recognizing names of places. Yeah. And that's really nice. Uh, but it doesn't really go much beyond that. Right, okay. Uh, another one that you've been playing then? Uh, I also played Britannia for the first ever time. Yeah, I saw you playing that yesterday. Yes, yesterday for about five hours. And how, the, the other players that were playing Britannia, had they all played before? Yes, I think right. they all played a couple of times. So, but this was my first ever game. Yeah. Um, and so Britannia, uh, is it's an old game. An old game, yes. It's, it's an old game. It's been around I'm a long sure time. When it was I played released. it in the 80s. My so word. I played the old version of it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you can tell it's an old game, mm -hmm. but you know, there's a lot of, lots of bits to worry about. And long. it takes five, six hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it's pretty smooth mm -hmm. um, for that. Because, I mean, you get a lot of games from that period and they kind yeah, of yeah, yeah, under yeah. the weight of their own rules a little bit. Yeah. This one doesn't too much. I mean, partly I wasn't responsible for teaching the game, yeah. which helps. Um, but it's yeah, very interesting. So it's it's the history of Britain from about the Roman invasion up to 1066, yeah. um, which is quite the scope. And so you end up, each player controls several... Four, isn't it, by the four, end? Four, yeah. Four yeah. different races of people over the course of that historical period. Yeah. Uh, so I had the pleasure of being the Picts up in Scotland who survived, who did a roaring job of seeing off the Romans <laughs> um, and just about anyone else who tried to uh, take the Highlands. Um, and the uh, Boudicca's people, whose yep. name I can't remember, who uh, nobly died as quickly as possible. Um, but then they're supposed to, so that's yep. okay. And it's just doing as much damage to the Romans as you can before uh, you're wiped out. Yeah. Um, the Angles and the Normans, right? Um, which is yeah, quite the mix of uh, people. So, how did you do in terms of victory points? Near in the terms end of, of the victory game? points, I managed to come second by doing about again. two points. Right, okay. Yeah. So, I, so <laughs> this I, one felt like I was doing well. I absolutely love Britannia as a system and as a game, and I think it's absolutely fantastic. But mm. I would never play it. Okay. So. There's, there's only one other game out there that I know of that's like Britannia called Italia, which was released about 10 years ago, and it's basically the same game, the same system, but based on what happened in Italy. Yep. Um, and I, I love it for two reasons. First of all, it's historical. Uh, and al although I'm not a big history buff, the game recreates what happened in history. Um, and as you say, over the course of the game, each player will play four factions. So you started off as the Picts. That was the only one that you were playing at the start of the game. Oh, Picts and two of the Boudicca's uh, chaps are down in the south. Right. But then as the game goes on, when the game reaches like round four or whatever, mm. your other one arrives. And then you get this other player mat and you're now controlling them at the same time. And each of the races or whatever that you control has their own objectives, their own victory point conditions and everything else. And the reason why I can't play the game again is that I think it requires all of the players to know all of the things, mm -hmm. what's coming in at every time, and all of the objectives of each individual one. So to give you an idea, and this is what I remember from playing it in the 80s, is it was two thirds of the way through the game. I got this new race, this right, you're now this, and this, that, and the other, and I saw on my chart how I was gonna score victory points. And I was like, brilliant. And then I did some moves and I did something else 
And then one of the other players came marching in and took York. And I didn't defend York as well as I that should have That kind done. of happened to me, actually, yes. Right. The Welsh come, suddenly came running across <laughs> uh, the Midlands uh, straight into York. I was like, oh, hi. But the reason they did that is it because it said on their card, if you control York by the end of round seven, you get six victory points. Yeah. And I didn't know that. If I'd have known that... I would have protected it more. So when you all know the game and you all know all of the mm. the way that every single race is going to get victory points, you will you will try to stop that. Mm. But as a as a game system that recreates you know the whole of English history up to mm. that point, I thought it was yeah fantastic as yeah. a game. I mean to be fair, I mean thematically, you know, I don't suppose the Angles were expecting the Welsh to come running across. True. <laughs> That's true. But as a <laughs> game, like you, if I was a more experienced player, I would have known that and I would have protected it more. So yeah. It was very nice. Uh, it reminded me like a lot of a more advanced, complicated small world. Right. Right. That sense of empire you have multiple empires yeah. over the course of a game. Have but you ever instead, played Vinci? I've not. No. Right. So Vinci is the game small prior world. to Small World yes. that was basically the Small World mechanic, but more complicated, and it took three times as long. Mm. And then yeah. Small World was the the modern Euro version of yeah. of Vinci. Yeah. So, so. Uh, yeah. So unlike Small World, you don't have to control over when your empires die no. off, but it feels. It also feels more scripted. Yes. Yeah. Because um, as you say, you're you're the Welsh. You'll get six points if you take York in this round. In this round. Therefore, that's what you do. Yeah. Exactly. You, know, you should be trying to do that. Yeah. So it's kind of like you're just kind of swaying the kind of edges of history a little bit. Yeah. I know the the other memorable moment I have from playing it is that whoever was the um, the, the the Welsh player, the Irish kept trying to invade. And there was basically one bloke with a spear that every round kept rolling a six or something like that. And he just, he just never got in. And yeah. for, 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 you know, decades, <laughs> yeah, the trying Irish were trying to invade there's just one bloke with a spear just, just <laughs> pushing him back. Again, games with dice for combat do allow for memorable moments like They do, that. and that's, that's the one thing that definitely sticks out. Yeah. This. yeah. So, anything else? Any other games of note that you wanted to talk about? Um... Well, I just played Zhang, uh, Zhang Guo. Which we were going to play, but then I was busy demoing. Yes. So, uh, fortunately, managed to get a game in because that's my first time uh, yep. playing that. Very nice game. Uh, and all, one of the What's Your Game mm -hmm. Euro teams. Solid like Euros. Nippon and uh, Railroad Revolution. Yeah. Just really good, dependable Euros. Um, I lost that one handedly. Uh, right. But I kind of have a good feeling for why, and I enjoyed the whole process throughout yeah. anyway. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally like that game that, you know, um, I, I like the card play mechanic and the way that it, it all works was all yes. very clever. I didn't quite get the building up of the tableau right in terms yeah. of the timing of get enough of get enough tableau out so that you can do lots of stuff on the board later. Yeah. I kind of rushed into the board I mean, stuff. I mean, when I do demos of that game, for the first round, I say, right, you, you want to put a card into your tableau, right? And they say, so I can put it in any of these five... Mm -hmm. Kingdom, provinces, what I can't yeah, remember regions, what they call, regions. Sure. And they say, does it matter which one I put it in? And I say, yes. But without going into a whole hold of most more rules and explaining what's going to happen in three turns time, yeah. you're not going to know which one to put it in. And then halfway through the game, they're like, oh, right, now I see. I probably should have put that one there and this one here and things like that. Because yep. yeah, where you put it does, does make a difference. Yes. So, cool. So you'd play that again? I would definitely play so that again. So are there any yes. games you've played this weekend that you would not play again? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, I don't have any to mind right. right now. So you've not played any games that you would write off as that was a bad game, I didn't enjoy it. Okay, the one game that uh, I'm, I'm not really liking that much is That's a Question. Okay. The new uh, Czech games. Yeah. gave us a quick demo of that last night. Yes. And you'd played it before anyway. I have played, played it before, it yeah, I played it at the expo. Um, yes. It needs like, the right group. Yeah, I and I don't think I'm necessarily a part of that. I think if you all know each other yep. very well and you're all comfortable with each other, you're probably okay. Yes. And I will probably enjoy it more under that circumstance. Yes. Uh, but when I've been playing it with basically strangers people, people you don't only really know, know yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, it's so awkward at times. Right. Like, it can <laughs> still be funny yep. if you go for the more innocent questions yep. of, you know, would you rather lose pizza or Christmas yes. forever? You know, um, that's fine. Um, but when you go into the dubious moral the choices, questions. the orange questions, yeah, yeah, yeah. orange for danger, yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, it's just it's just unpleasant. Yeah, I mean, I've been demoing this game now for I don't know months and months and months, mm. and it, it is hit or miss. 
you know, when you sit down with a group of medium to heavy Euro gamers like we are, they're like, well, th this isn't even a game. And then you sit down with other people who are more of the, we like the social party game mm. type thing, and, and they're loving it. Right. So it, it's definitely, whereas Codenames, I think appeals to a massive wide variety of players. Yes. That's a question definitely fits in with the more it's social fun party, party game. game. Yeah, yes. yeah. It's, it's about having a laugh at what people are choosing, what people think about each other and yeah. stuff like that. I mean, I don't think CG will mind to say that I, I would probably never play that's a question myself at home with my play group mm. ever. I mean, I'm happy to do demos of it at conventions yes. with, with the right group uh, who are enjoying it, but it's not a game I would, I would personally play. Yeah. So anyway, moving on to another topic that I wanted to talk about. Um, a few people have asked me over the last few months to talk about blind playtesting. And some people have asked me to record a video about it and I've, ne I've never got around to it. And I always thought about uh, writing about it on my Board Game Geek Guild and I never got around to that either. So I thought this is a good opportunity to talk about it um, because I'm actually doing it this weekend. So blind playtesting, like many, many other terms, means different things to different people. So blind testing to some people means I'm gonna send some guy, you, mm -hmm. a copy of my game with the rule book in the post yep. and you play it. And then you will feed back to me whether people enjoyed it or not. Yes. Okay? That's, well, not just enjoyed it, but any balance issues or anything else. That's one form of blind play testing. And that's designed to get, um, you know, an external opinion of your game to see what balance issues there are. Now, um, Ignacy Trebuchet from Portal Games said in a, a Dice Tower live show that he did that he doesn't do that. And the reason he doesn't do that is absolutely right and I completely agree with. I send you the game, you sit down, you play it with your friends, you get a few key rules completely wrong. I don't know you've got those rules yes. wrong. You, f you fill in a feedback form and you give me all of these comments that I should throw in the bin because actually you played a, a fundamental rule wrong. Mm. Now, this is in the playtesting stage, so the rule book for the game's not really been written. Of course, you will have been given a rule book, but it's likely an early draft, it won't be polished, it won't be finished. The chance of you getting a rule wrong is actually quite high because rule books are not generally written until the very end of the process. Mm. So blind playtesting in that respect, I completely agree with Ignacy, is it, it dangerous to do it. The safest way to do it is that I would turn up at your house, I would teach you how to play the game, I would sit there quietly and watch to make sure you got the rules right, and then I'd ask you to fill in the feedback forms and then I'd take them away, mm -hmm. okay? The blind playtesting I do is not that kind of blind playtesting. So mm -hmm. that's one kind of blind playtesting. The one I do is actually testing the rule book. So this weekend I've brought two games here for blind playtesting, and we're not playtesting the game, the game's done, mm -hmm. I've written the rule book, or I've helped write the rule book, we're now testing the rule book. So it's basically, here's the game, here's the rule book that we're going to print, are you able to learn how to play the game correctly from that rule book, and I need to be there and not say anything. So I have to sit there, and me not saying anything is very difficult for me to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, but I basically sit there and I watch them and they go, right, and they open the box and they take the rule book out and they start reading it and I've got to sit there quietly and I, I watch them and I watch their facial expressions and everything else and if he's reading it and he looks confused, there's a red flag. Mm -hmm. And I'll make a note. And he said, he was reading the components list and he was confused. And then I'll go back at the end of the session, I'll say, why were you confused on the components list? And he said, well, it said there were 23 of this card and then he said there were 12 of this card but I didn't know which one was which. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, right, how can we fix that? We'll put an image in the components list of that component. And he said, yeah, that'll work. So I have to sit there for the whole game uh, and basically, first of all, see if they play correctly. And if they play incorrectly, that's when I interrupt them. I actually say, guys, you're playing a rule wrong. This is the right rule. I'll make a note in the rule book and then I'll let them carry on. Right. I don't want them to play the game incorrectly but I want to see if they can work out how to play it. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we tested the rule book for Diesel Demolition Derby from Luda Creations, yes. uh, which is an almost finished rule book. They had one question in, in setup, which I've made a note of in the rule book, and we'll go back and we'll fix that. And then there was something that happened in the game where the explanation in the rule book of how that rule worked applies to most situations, but there was one particular situation where it wasn't quite covered. 
So mm-hmm. I've gone back, I've written to the designer of Lude Creations and we'll add that in there. So yeah, it's um, those. yeah, it's catching edge those. Uh, it's catching those edge cases, but it's it's a real test because those people would have bought that game, taken it home, got the game, got the rule book. Can they learn how to play the game from the rule book? And that for me as a rule book writer and editor is more important than did you enjoy the game? That's, that's irrelevant for this conversation. This is, were you able to play the game correctly? And by that stage of the game, the game's development. Yes. That's the important question. Yes, at that point. to figure out. Yeah. Right? So, um, yeah, so I've been doing that for Diesel Demolition Derby. I also did it for another game called Legends Untold, um, which is a far more complex game than Diesel Demolition Derby, which is a 20, 30 minute light mm. sort of card drafting game. Uh, and Legends Untold is a fairly... A uh, complex simulation of a sort of role play type game, but without a GM. So it's a fantasy cooperative adventure game with lots of things that could happen. There's traps, there's obstacles, there's curiosity, there's lots of tests. There's so much theme in the game to replicate all these different things that can happen, but therefore that leads to more complex rules. Mm-hmm. Um, so the Diesel Demolition Derby rulebook is, is done, about to go, you know, it's on Kickstarter right now. So yeah. that project is wrapping up and we're just catching the few little things. The Legends Untold one, that was the first draft of the rule book. So I was expecting dozens and dozens of comments and feedback, yep. and I got them. Good. But this is exactly <laughs> why I brought it this weekend. So that rule book now has lots and lots of scribbles all over it. Yep. Um, At that stage, right, is it worth doing more than one absolutely. test of it? Yeah. But I don't know whether it's worth doing another one now. Mm. Um, what I need to do is I need to go away, I need to add in all of those comments into the new rule book. There's also a couple of development things that were, that were brought up in the game, so some rules might be changing, and then I need to give it to another group. So one reason why publishers, because you might think, well, why doesn't every publisher do this? Mm-hmm. It takes time. It takes a lot of time. And when you've got deadlines and you've got release dates like Essen and you've got you know, Kickstarter campaign, kick, Kickstarter games where you've promised your backers will get it this point, mm-hmm. they, they don't see the time that's involved in the whole process. So writing and editing a rule book is one thing. And almost every rule book that I'm involved in, I always send to two or three extra people after I've written it who don't know anything about the game mm-hmm. to say, does this read correctly? That's not even them playing the game. But yeah. the only real test for me is you've got the game in front of you, you've got the rule book, can you learn how to play from the rule book? And if you can't, then as far as I'm concerned, that rule book fails to me. I have two criteria for a rule book. One, you're able to play the game correctly from the rules without referring to any other external source. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's the main one. And the second one is when a situation crops up in the game, you can easily find it in the rule book. That is the test. And that, that's another test. Yeah. Now, um, when I was at a seminar in Germany recently, the two uh, publishers that got talked about were CGE and GMT Games. So mm. CGE Games, were, if it's a game designed by Vlager, Vlager is heavily involved in writing the rule book himself, along mm. with Jason Holt, our American guy. The rule books are brilliantly written, and I'm not just saying that because I work for them, but they are a pleasure to Wonderfully read. Wonderfully edited. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Well, I, do, I don't really get involved <laughs> oh, okay. in the CG rules. I do a tiny bit, but really not much, because um, they've got such a good team that do it anyway. I just learned how they did it and apply that to other people. Um, but for, for learning the game, I think they're brilliant. Yeah, I really like their... The, the like, style and... Like, uh, Space the, Alert is one yeah, yeah, yeah. in my mind is the, the story-driven... Yes. So for learning the game, really, really good. For finding information afterwards, when you go, oh, I know there's a rule about that, where is it? People have said it's harder to find in a rule book that's written that way. Yes. On the other scale, you've got GMT. Now, I don't have much experience with GMT rule books, so I'm quoting what other people have said here, but very, very difficult to learn how to play from the rule book, but then when you want to find a rule later, they're really, really good. Yep. You, you, I think you, I you go to an index or something and it's like page this and there, it, it's right there. Yeah, I mean, so. it's, they're bullet pointed if every single rule right. is, you know, 6.5.2. Right. See, um, I don't like bullet point. That's, which that's is, old school. It is. Yeah. Um, well, it is GMT. Yeah. Um, but it certainly, I do like the way it's broken up like right. that, like, you know, almost individual rules. Yeah. Um, I would agree. I've only played Twilight Struggle, so I've only, and that's right. a fairly easy one to learn. Okay. Uh, like compared to a lot of GMT compared to a games. lot of other games. Um, 
So it's not too bad to learn it. Right. But that's because it's a fairly straightforward okay. game comparatively. But finding stuff afterwards the fight after was, was, was really, fine. really good. Right. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so they made my basic two main criteria for a rule book. Um, and obviously the blind playtesting of the rule book helps that. But yeah, it does take time. Um, and that's one reason why. How much time do you, I mean, I guess it's gonna be as long as a piece of string, but you know. Yeah, it really depends on the game. Um, you know, and it depends on the involvement in the rule book. So Diesel mm. Demolition Derby, I was involved in the rule book process. I was one of a, uh, a member of a, a small team mm -hmm. that were involved in editing that rule book. And it's like a, a 10 page rule book for a fairly simple game. Legends Untold, I've, I've been helping write it from scratch. So me and the designer and the publisher, we've been working the three of us together mm. to come up with the rule book. Um, so it's a, it's a much smaller team, a much more complex game. And yeah, this is, this is the, the sort of first test of it. Do you have an estimate of how long that one might take then? As oh. a I'm mean, guessing it's gonna be quite a while. Yeah, it's how quite, it's quite, it is, it's quite a while. Perfect. You know, one of the things, um, Kev and Hugh, that, uh, the, you know, they've been working on the game for years. They know the game like the back of their hand. And they've been through many, many iterations and design and development choices. And I came in knowing nothing about the game at all and started asking fundamental questions. And they were like, well, you, you just do this. And I'm like, well, that's great, but that's not, that, that's not in the rule book. So I had to, with that rule book, I had to really, really take a step back from what they had. And I actually start saying, right, you know, this is a cooperative game because it didn't say that at the start. I can imagine being the designer of the game you're, you're, you become almost the worst person to write the rule book yes. in some yeah. ways. A lot of people say they should never, you know, the designer should never write it and that you should always get somebody who doesn't know how to play the game to read it. Certainly. Uh, and a lot of companies do that. Um, but the blind play testing is, is an extra step that a lot of people don't do. Time, money, all of that other mm. stuff. There's reasons why people don't do it. But the danger if you don't do it is that your game gets released People go out there, people buy it, and people can't play it. Or, or they do play it, but they're having to make up rules on the fly. Or even worse, they're playing it incorrectly, but they don't know they're playing it incorrectly, and therefore they don't think it's a problem. And then their feedback is... And their feedback or their comments on BGG or, useless, or anything yeah. like that is, is, is tainted. Um, I mean, I played my first five games of Great Western Trail, mm. I played incorrectly. There was a key rule, that I got wrong. Yeah. We all enjoyed the game, we all loved the game, but we all felt that one particular strategy was too good. And I was speaking to somebody about it, and then they said, well, you were doing this, weren't you? And I was like, no. I was like, oh, right. <laughs> well, that, that, you should have done that. Went back to the rule book, it's absolutely clear in a big red box. <laughs> I just read it, yeah. I missed it. Yeah. And then the next game is we, obviously you forget it once and you forget it all yes, the time. Yes, because you think you've got it right, right? You've had a really good experience and nothing's come up that seems no, wrong. But I could have easily yeah. put that game away and said it's got balance issues or this, that and the other. So yeah, that's not a fault with the rule book. The rule book of Great Western Trail is one of the best rule books ever written. The guy who did it's that. just a lot of rules. And Mombasa, <laughs> yeah, yeah, a lot that's of rules, but, but very good. So I'm, I'm Part, part of my thing that I want to do next is I want to speak to the guy who did the writing and editing of both of the rule books for Great Western Trail and Mombasa, because mm. I think they are two of the best rule books that have come out recently. Every single rule of the game is in there. I was able to learn the game completely from the rule book, although I got a rule wrong, but that was my fault. Mm. And anything I needed afterwards, I was able to easily find. They're just really, really well done rule books. Mm. Uh, and I just want to speak to him, thank yeah. him. But also I'm, I'm curious professionally as to was it blind play tested? Did he, what process did he do? Because some people are just really good at it and probably yeah. don't need that. So we shall see. But yeah, yeah, so for those people who wanted to ask me about blind play testing, that's a little bit about it. Um, I've been doing it this weekend. If you've got any more questions about it, feel free to post them on my BGG Guild and I'll happily answer them. Um, and it's an enjoyable process, but it's, it's part of the process. So uh, let's wrap up this podcast. Um, what day is it? Sunday. You're here till tomorrow? I am heading home this evening. You're heading home this evening. Yes. I'm here till tomorrow. Manicon runs from a Friday to a Monday, uh, which is a bit unusual. Most conventions seem to be Thursday to Sunday, but this is Friday to Monday. So I'm going to be here till this time tomorrow. Very nice. I might actually get a game in. 
I'm really what? tempted to play Founders of Gloomhaven. I've been I've been watching it been played seven times. <laughs> I want to play it myself. But have you played it at all? Do you must have played I played it, it twice. Okay, yeah. Yes. Cool. I played it twice to get a feel of how it played myself. Um, to prepare myself for right, how am I now gonna teach other people how to play this yes. game? So I needed to play through it twice myself first before coming up with a way of teaching it to people. Well now I think you've trained up a few people over oh, a they, few they games could now. now. Yeah. Yeah. There's some good opponents out there. Now. So yeah, I mean, yeah, people are making lots of mistakes in their first game, but then, you know, they won't make them again. Well they might do. I know my second game I made tons of mistakes. I was I was more concentrated on teaching the other people mm -hmm. rather than focusing on my own thing, which is one reason why when I'm demoing, I never play. I'm a big believer that the person doing the demo, if it's a demo, they should never play the game. They should be focused on teaching the other people, helping them, and if they're the designer, making notes. Yeah, rather even than they're not teaching it very well because they're focusing on the game or they're not focusing on the game and ruining the experience. Yeah, for, for other people. Plays. So, yeah, anyway, right. So, anything else you want to talk about? Quick plug for your stuff. What are you up yes. to at the moment? Um, I'm trying to work through the backlog of uh, review copies I've picked up at the UK Games Expo okay. today. Um, I've got reviews for uh, like Baron Park coming yeah. out. Uh, I've got a copy of Dice Forge here that I've mm -hmm. been playing. Um, I've got Pocket Mars. Yeah. So um, these are all review copies you got given. Yeah. And therefore you are obligated to Indeed. write a review. Yeah. So review when you started doing reviews, it was like, oh, a publisher's given me a free copy of a game. This is cool. Yeah? yeah. Are you now at the point where you're like, oh my God, I've just been given 12 games. How am I going to do all of this? It, it sounds, I feel kind of bad for feeling that way <laughs> because, you know, it's like, oh, first world problems. Right? Yes, yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Too much free stuff. Oh, yeah, God. yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I've got like 13 or so games of, I, I got to that point. I'm slowly bringing that total back down. Yeah. It's like I, I put out two articles a week. Yep. That's, that's, you know, six to seven weeks worth of stuff blocked out, yes. right? Yeah. And so that's now more than a month and a half before I can yeah. do, anything, do else anything else in many ways. Yeah. I mean, to review a game properly, you need to play it a few times. You need to... Exactly. And I know. feel bad for, you know, the publishers giving me the game. They want to review you know, within a reasonably short amount of time. Yeah. You know, I normally, you know, three to six weeks. Yeah. It's always been my aim. And it's slightly slipping a little bit yeah. this time, but... Yeah. But for those people out there who think, oh, these reviewers, they just get free games. It's, it, yeah, they do get free games, but it's not free. You know, you got given a copy of a game that would have cost you 20 quid if you bought it, and how many hours would it take you to yeah, play through it? Exactly, and then write a, a review, and you know, your reviews are, they're, they're well written, and it's clear that you haven't just gone, oh, I'm gonna write a review, tap, 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 send. You actually properly write it and go back and yeah, you know, pictures to take and editing them. Yeah, yes, editing the articles takes a shocking amount of time. Yeah, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you go back and you read it afterwards, and you're it's like, like ah, "Did I write this?" Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm the same with rule books. I'm writing rules, and I'm like, "That makes no sense to me." The day afterwards. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So you're, you've got a bit of a backlog of reviews. So yeah, and the watch this space. The worst thing is it means you don't get to play anything else. So like I was saying, yeah. what's great about these conventions is that I finally have a block of time, you know, a weekend where I can guilt-free play right. a bunch of older stuff. So like, I haven't played Great Western Trail in months, right. and I love that game. Yeah. <laughs> Have you done a review for it? I did, yes. Right. Um, and so once I do the review, it's like, well, now what's the next one? Yes, and but with a game really like great that, to get back to something you want to go back really to it. Yeah. But presumably there are some reviews that you do for games where once you've played it enough and then done the review, you're like, right, I'm done with that game now. Yes, right. yes there are. And at that point, I have to try and figure out how not to shift it out of my house. Right. I don't. I don't sell on review copies. Okay. Um, I tend to. I've given a load away to some charity stuff. For yes. Or I ran yeah. a giveaway actually just recently to celebrate two years. Yes. Of two years. Show. Yeah. So I, I gave away the pile that was building up in the corner of my bedroom. Right. Which was annoying my girlfriend endlessly. So there we go. Thank you very much for for joining me on the show, and um, I will talk to you soon. Thank you very much for having me. Okay. 
So just another bit of recording which I've made after Manacon. I did actually play one more game. So this was after I'd done the recording with Matt, I did end up playing a game on the Sunday myself. And this was Thunder Alley. Now, I've been looking at Thunder Alley now for a few years. I've heard lots and lots of good things about it. Um, and I really want a good racing game. I've tried so many different racing games over the over the past and none of them have really clicked with me properly. Um, I'm, a, I'm a Formula One fan. I watch Formula One, uh, which is the only real sport that I, I follow. And I've been after a good a good racing game and I know that the people who make Thunder Alley GMT they've done a game called Grand Prix which is using the Thunder Alley mechanics uh, and because I'd heard lots about it I really wanted to try and play so we played it I can kind of enjoyed the game it was four players so we had four cars each uh, it took two hours 40 it probably shouldn't have taken that long. Um, I really, really liked the way that the mechanics seemed to thematically fit what was going on. You've basically got cards with four different types of movement. Uh, some of them pull all the cars behind you. Some of them push all the cars ahead of you. And then you've got movement left and right, and you have to spend movement points. And it's all great, but we had a reference sheet which reminded us of all of the different types of movement. And even at the end of the game, we were still like, oh, I'm, I'm not really sure what this one does. Does it cost one or does this cost two? Now, Andy, the guy who taught me, he knew the rules really, really well. We didn't need to look at the rule book for anything for that. Um, and I'm sure with, with a couple of games, that'll become fine. The reason why I wouldn't play it again is I found it was massively swingy. So, you know, at one point, somebody would be winning. And then a couple of turns later, they would be in the middle of the pack and a completely different three set of cars would be at the front. And then a lap after that, or, or a few turns after that, it would completely change around again. Now, I don't watch NASCAR racing, and it, it might be like this. And we did have a couple of yellow flags, which, which bunched the whole pack up. But it seemed that you could get a massive advantage from just being in the right place at the right time and other people dragging you along. And that, that's actually the skill of the game, I guess, is, is thinking, well, that guy's probably going to want to move and take his cars with him, so I'll move my car so it's in position behind and therefore I'll piggyback off the others. But yeah, over the course of the game, I found it was extremely swingy and uh, yeah, I'm glad I've played it. I now know how the mechanic works and that was it. So yeah, the rest of Manacon for me was uh, doing some more demos of some of the games that I'd taken there, some more Founders of Gloomhaven. I think I ended up demoing that 10 times in total over the weekend. Then uh, another demo game of Legends Untold, another one of Diesel Demolition Derby, and plenty more games of Codename Duet was going on. So that's pretty much it. That's, that's going to be the end of this podcast. Uh, as I say, if you want to engage with me, then either put some notes in the YouTube channel in the comments there or on the BGG Guild, which is guild number 2258, if you want to talk about anything to do with blind playtesting or if you want to talk about any of the games that we've covered in this podcast. The Gaming Rules podcast is sponsored by Gameslaw, the UK's largest specialist games retailer at gameslaw.com. Thank you to Jason Shaw at audionautics.com for the Gaming Rules theme tune and the music used in this podcast. I am also a member of the Board Game Trading and Chat Facebook group in the UK and a proud member of Punchboard Media, where we all bring something to the table. Until next time, take care and thanks for listening.